Hi, Yolanda. Hey there, how you doing? Good, doing good, nice to see you. All right, I like seeing the attendees. So I will uh, let them in in a moment. All right. Let's message them real quick. There's the Dean, beautiful. All right, there she is. There we go. Okay. Ah, there, there's Dr. Caldwell. Good, good work. Hi, Dr. Caldwell. Yeah, no problem. Terrific. Thank you so much. I'll uh, uh, I'll let our actually I'll let our attendees in just two seconds. Okay. And then uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, we'll take it from there. And uh, one thing I did want to mention as well, Dr. Cowell, that my colleague here, Yolanda, was such a great uh, uh, colleague and support to kind of help get all these pieces together for today. So I just wanted to acknowledge that one. Thank you, Yolanda. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. So I will introduce you and then we'll have q and I'll ask them to post it in the Q&A place. At the end, uh, depending on our time, I will bring up those questions. Okay. So. All right, so let's go ahead and start off here. Uh, welcome everybody. I just uh, wanted to say uh, the College of Natural Sciences is very proud uh, to present the Climate, Oceans and Human Health, what cholera can teach us about COVID-19, a distinguished lecture uh, by Dr. Rita Caldwell, who is joining us here uh, today. We're very excited, but before we get any further, I did want to make sure that we turn oh, I, uh, turn this over to uh, Dr. Sastri Pantula, Dean of the College of Natural Sciences. Roberto, okay. they're, not, they're not in yet. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So, yeah, I see people are joining and I, I will uh, speak in just in one minute. Okay. Right, yeah. Thank you. Um, let's just give one more minute and then I'll start. Okay. And we already have a Q&A in the Q&A. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so. All right. OK, um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, it's a little after 11 o'clock here. Um, so good morning, everybody. Thank you for all of you for joining this morning. You know, you are in for a real treat. It is my great honor and a pleasure to introduce our visitor, Dr. Rita Caldwell. She is a distinguished professor at the University of Maryland, a leading scientist on global infectious diseases, and the first female NSF director from 1998 to 2004. One thing that I really enjoy about her is her commitment to enhancing diversity in STEM fields, education, as well as leadership and K through 12 science and math education. Most recently, I read one of the reports that she chaired from the National Academies Committee that produced a report called Promising Practices for addressing the underrepresentation of women in STEM opening doors. Her CV is extensive, lists many, many publications, honors, awards, and her research and leadership contributions from not only US, but also from various countries around the globe including Japan, Sweden, Australia, France, Bangladesh, et cetera. The most recent being William Bowie Medal from the Ameri <clears throat> American Geophysical Union. She has over 60 honorary doctorates. I also want to put in a plug for her recent book, A Lab of One's Own, one woman's personal journey through sexism. Again, I can go on for the whole hour talking about uh, her excellent research and contributions to the science, but you're not here to hear about me talking about her, but we are here for hearing about her research and excellent work. So before I turn things over to Dr. Rita Caldwell, 
Let me remind folks to pose your questions in the Q&A box. We already started getting some and we will ask her at the end of her talk. Again, welcome. Welcome, Dr. Caldwell. Thank you very much. Let me um, um, see if I can um, share a screen. The host disabled participant screen sharing. Dr. Caldwell yeah. should have co-hosting. Okay, here we go. Good. Um, let's see if I can pull this down and let's maximize slideshow from the beginning. How was that? Does that show up? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you all very much. I, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to, to uh, speak to um, students and faculty and friends of the um, university of California State University at San Bernardino. Um, I thank you for the kind introduction, um, Dr. Patula. And um, I'm going to spend my time talking about water-related diseases, uh, particularly uh, those diseases <clears throat> associated um, with uh, diarrheal disease, uh, such as cholera, because it, it, it affects about um, one and a half or almost two billion people every year <clears throat> with um, almost 2 million deaths. The irony of it is that um, this uh, disease, cholera, is a global disease. It's a, an acute water-related diarrheal disease. And we are in a pandemic. We are, have been in the seventh pandemic of this the particular disease uh, that started in the 1960s, at the same time that we've been suffering a second pandemic of COVID-19. And so I'm going to talk a bit about this um, underlying pandemic that we've been suffering um, because it occurs in about 50 countries. It affects about 7 million people uh, on an annual basis and um, billions overall. We've unfairly ascribed the disease to um, uh, Bangladesh and India when really 100 years ago, we had cholera in Washington, D.C., New York, in the Gulf of Mexico, in Canada, in Europe, uh, Asia, because it was a disease that we learned uh, and made the discovery, my laboratory did about um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that the bacteria that cause the disease are naturally occurring and exist in the natural environment. And we've seen new serotypes emerge uh, just as we've seen new um, uh, types emerging from COVID-19 uh, virus, but we had also observed this occurring with the shifting of genes and the variation in the um, uh, genomes of the bacteria. So it's unlikely that we will be able to eradicate cholera. And I suspect it may be unlikely now that we've had a global pandemic of COVID-19, that we'll be able to eradicate it, control it as we can control cholera, but eradicate, not so sure. Now, I started my work really to understand this native aquatic bacterium in the Chesapeake Bay of the United States. It's on the East Coast, a massive um, um, bay that uh, runs uh, from um, Virginia all the way to Pennsylvania, really. Um, we were able to study the stations, which are numbered on the map, back in the 60s and 70s, and continue to monitor them to this day. We discovered not only was the bacterium Vibrio cholerae, which you can see in the slide, a rod-shaped bacterium with a single polar flagellum or tail that allows it to swim in aquatic um, medium, we found that it was uh, associated with plankton, specifically with the copepod, a component of the zooplankton in the natural environment. The copepods are common to bodies of water, freshwater, uh, rivers, coastal waters, and even along in the ocean. So this is a bacterium that exists in the natural environment. Further proof of its being a naturally occurring bacterium 
is the fact that we discovered that many of the Vibrio cholerae that cause cholera are luminescent. They have genes for bioluminescent, meaning that when grown in the laboratory, they will produce light. We also found that they carry a very important enzyme, a, a, a chitinolytic enzyme, an enzyme that breaks down the N-acetylglucosamine structure, the polymer, that gives crabs, shrimp, and copepods the hard shell structure. And so these bacteria mineralize that structure and recycle. So they're sort of like the janitors of the environment, recycling the massive populations of the crustaceans in the natural aquatic system. Here's the copepod. The other aspect of the bacteria is that they tend to aggregate and coat on the egg sac. You can see in this gravid female ready to expel her eggs into the uh, her eggs into the water, the egg sac is covered with bacteria. The bacteria produce a very powerful proteolytic enzyme. Hence, we believe that the bacteria are symbiotic to the copepod, or at least commensal, in that when the egg sac is ripe, the bacterial enzyme breaks down the protein and the eggs are cast into the water system, part of the natural cycle of the copepod. Very early on, some 30 years ago, we developed this simple model of how the disease was transmitted. In the spring, with increased sunlight, the phytoplankton, which carry chlorophyll, become very abundant, they bloom. The zooplankton, of which the copepod is a dominant component, feed on the phytoplankton. And when the supply of nutrient is exhausted, then they, the breakdown of the populations releases the vibrios into the water. And then people who drink the water without treatment, as was done until 100 years ago, until about 1910 or 1920, when chlorination was introduced. Chlorination and water treatment and distribu distribution of safe drinking water to households. We don't have cholera outbreaks anymore in the US. We don't get vaccinated against cholera. We don't need to because the water we drink is safe as it is in Europe and in Japan, Singapore, but not in many of the other countries, particularly Latin America and Africa. The lesser developed countries have not yet achieved this distribution of safe water which is really important for human health. Now, the other part of the story that turned out to be fascinating was that this cycle of spring bloom and in Bangladesh, spring and fall, year after year, epidemics of cholera would occur. It, it, it came to my mind that since chlorophyll was associated by virtue of the phytoplankton first blooming or becoming dominant and then serving as food for the zooplankton. Back in 1975, 1980, it, satellites were launched. The first major satellite was Landsat. It measured chlorophyll. It measured sea surface temperature and sea surface height, very primitive at that time, 20 years ago. But it occurred to me, well, if you could measure the chlorophyll by satellite, we could predict cholera epidemics. So in fact, we did the experiment. Or I should say, first of all, what we had learned about cholera in Chesapeake Bay was challenged by colleagues saying, did that really work in Bangladesh? So we went to Bangladesh to do the same experiments that we had done 
in the Chesapeake Bay. And indeed, firstly, in the remote villages, as you see here, the villages were taking their water for drinking in the same ponds where utensils were washed, where personal hygiene was carried out. And in the far corner, a latrine would drain into the pond. So there was contamination taking place. But we did discover that in Bangladesh, the same pattern of the bacteria being associated predominantly with the copepods, but also we could pick it up because of the severe contamination in some other components of the plankton. Nevertheless, with poor sanitation, person-to-person -person transmission was very strong and dominant, but the source really was the environment. So this model held up from what we had discovered in the Chesapeake Bay doing work at the time on trying to understand the microbiology of Chesapeake Bay and making this discovery of the relationship of vibrios with plankton and discovering the presence of vibrio cholerae in Chesapeake Bay when we hadn't had an outbreak in 100 years. So this then confirmed the environmental nature of the microorganism and the transmission person to person really deriving from the environment. But again, the notion of the measurement by satellite intrigued me. And so my students and I then did the experiment where we gathered the data on cases of cholera in Bangladesh down along the coast. And then working with NASA, Ames, the laboratory in California, we were able to take satellite images of the Bay of Bengal and match up, which turned out to be incredibly uh, exciting. Here you can see the sea surface temperature measured by the Landsat satellite. And the red line is, are the cases of cholera in the Bay of Bengal. The blue line is the temperature just off the coast of the Bay of Bengal measured by satellite. And the red line are the cases of cholera in those villages lining the coastline of Bangladesh and the Bay of Bengal. So that led us to our first major, well, our second major discovery, the first being that the bacterium is naturally occurring in the environment and there is no host, human host in the, um, uh, that exists that could not be, it has not been shown to have a human host. In fact, extensive studies were done. So we were able to demonstrate the presence in the environment and then being able to show that we could actually predict outbreaks of cholera using satellite sensing. Many other parameters had been gathered on flooding and rainfall, salinity, and uh, the presence of dissolved organic matter. There was a report of a re correlation with fecal contamination. However, one of my students, um, former students, Dr. Uh, James Caper, who is now assistant dean of the medical school in Baltimore, University of Maryland. Jim, in his research some 20 or 30 years ago, showed that the, there was an inverse relationship with fecal contamination. In other words, the bacterium is naturally occurring and is actually inhibited when the environment becomes too polluted. We have since improved our model significantly because there are many more satellites that have been launched in, since in the um, uh, 20, 40 years since we did our first experiments. And these satellites are highly sensitive and uh, very effective. As you can see in the lower left, we started with the Landsat <clears throat> that was launched in um, 1999 that gave us the first set of data. And now we are using a whole host of 
more sophisticated satellites, which will provide data on the movement of populations. In other words, actually showing people escaping, for example, in Yemen from civil war, you can actually monitor the movement uh, of the populations away from the fighting and the aggregation of populations, as well as measuring many other uh, parameters. What is very interesting is whereas we had to use back in 1996 and uh, tw some 25 years ago, we had to use Landsat and measure one mile quadrant in the Bay of Bengal. Now we can measure one square meter in a, in a pond in Bangladesh. So we can do much more sophisticated uh, measurements and calculations. This has allowed us to be able to track the potential of risk of cholera. And here I'm showing Hurricane Matthew, which traversed Haiti in 1917, 1915, um, 1915, the Haiti hurricane that came up the east coast of the US. We retrospectively, we went back to the data and we calculated using our sophisticated model shown on the left, the risk of cholera in Haiti as a result of Hurricane Matthew. And you can see the dark red area was highest risk, predicted risk of cholera. And when we actually calculated the numbers of cases, we found that our prediction was really right on the money, so to speak. We were able to do the prediction in this retrospective study. We published those data, and then we did another analysis. There was a massive outbreak of cholera in 2017 in Yemen, in continental Africa. We did the retrospective analysis and showed on the left, the high risk and shown in the bottom right, the actual cases. It turned out that we published this paper rather quickly in 2000, late 2017. And in 2018, in January, we received a phone call um, at the lab from a, um, an administrator of the British Aid Agency in London asking us, because he had read our papers, if we could collaborate and provide them with monthly prediction of cholera in Yemen because the cholera epidemic was continuing. They would then locate physicians, medical supplies, and safe water, drinking water supplies, where we showed the highest risk. And that is what we have been doing ever since. And in late 2018, because they were able to locate physicians and medical supplies and safe water, it was much reduced, significantly reduced cholera cases. And we continue in two, continued in 2019, uh, where the reduction wasn't as dramatic, but still it was much lower than 2017. And that's because with the introduction of medical supplies and safe water, the numbers of cases were much reduced. So this has been a way for the British Aid Agency and UNICEF now to monitor cholera in Yemen we are moving the uh, work to increase other countries of Africa, Senegal, Mad uh, uh, Mozambique, and um, hopefully we will be able to collaborate in the D Democratic Republic of Congo. But this provides a month ahead of time prediction of the risk and allows preparation for the disease. So we also learned something else. We learned 
by going back to the original data on cholera in India, monitored by the British colonials from 1823 to about 1930, we were able to transfer the data in collaboration with a physician, Dr. Elizabeth Whitcomb, practicing medicine in London, uh, but a, a um, citizen of, of, um, of, um, of Australia and um, being able to, she helped us get the data um, transferred to the computer. And we were able to determine that there were two kinds of cholera. There's endemic cholera, which occurs year after year after year along the coast of India. And then epidemic cholera that occurs inland, places like Delhi, located on a river. But when there's a very heavy rainfall preceded by very, very hot weather, that combination, when mixed with, let's say, a religious festival or a gathering of many thousands of people in one place, that mix of factors leads to epidemic cholera, where you suddenly have thousands of cases. And once the cases recede, the populations move away, uh, go back to their homes, and the epidemic recedes, there might not be another breakout of cholera until those conditions again concatenate. So there's epidemic cholera and endemic cholera as a result of these studies. Let me switch now very briefly, going from satellites, computational modeling to DNA sequencing and learning from the molecular phase up. Here we developed some 10 or 12 years ago, the capability to extract DNA from water, soil, um, fecal samples, blood, urine, as a medical uh, capacity for identification of pathogens to understanding the whole microbial composition, bacteria, viruses, fungus, and protists in any sample. The DNA that's extracted is sequenced by any sequencer, Illumina, Ion, Torrent, doesn't matter, it's agnostic. The sequence reads are matched against a database that we have constructed of 160,000 highly curated genomes. That allows identification, but it also allows us to go to the next step and match up against gene sequences and to be able to determine the presence of antibiotic resistance, metabolic properties, pathogenic properties coded by genes. And so we can identify and characterize the total microbial population in samples. And we can identify right down to strain, which is really important because if you are, let's say, someone who works in a factory manufacturing yogurt, you would use one strain of lactobacillus um, uh, casei. If you are making Chardonnay wine, you would use a different strain of lactobacillus casei. And then if you're making cheese, yet another strain is used. So strain really matters, particularly in medicine, because if you isolate from a victim of a severe infection, E. coli, that E. coli is a strain very different from the E. coli we all have in our gut. So strain matters. So we've been able to use this kind of analysis in a big study, um, which needs to be published with our team at the National Institute of Cholera and Enteric Diseases in, in Calcutta, India. They provided us with samples where in, in phases where First, they sent us samples where they could isolate Vibrio cholerae in the cholera hospital. Then a set of samples where they couldn't, but the patient had all the symptoms, and that was unknown etiology, along with some control samples from 
um, usually medical students and um, personnel who, um, who are healthy and provided a stool samples that could be analyzed and then another set of all three. They did the work on all the classical tests for bacteria, viruses, and parasites and sent us the extracted DNA blinded. We were able to show that the red area are the pathogens. We were able to show that yes, in the known samples where they isolated Vibrio cholerae, we detected Vibrio cholerae, but we also found enteropathogenic E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, other pathogens. So that led us to the conclusion that we really need to be discussing polymicrobial infections. We need to get beyond the Koch postulate of the single pathogen causing the disease. For the unknown et et etiology, where they could not isolate Vibrio cholerae, we were able to find the presence of mostly enteropathogenic E. coli. And then interestingly, in the healthy population, we found in the red area, uh, th those are the bacteria that can be pathogenic. Uh, we downloaded from the NIH Human Microbiome Database, the bottom right are the is the analysis of the compiled Western gut flora. And you can see a very thin red line or a, se or a sector, which means that some of us do carry pathogens. We don't, um, we're not symptomatic and we don't transmit the disease, but much lower numbers than in the population uh, in India. We've since looked at a variety of enteric infections, Crohn's disease, for example. We looked at adults healthy and Crohn's disease adults and found that the green are the bacteria that the healthy individual had in the study, whereas the red are those bacteria and the incidence of those bacteria that are dominant in the Crohn's disease. So we're able now to characterize disease. But let me show you an example of water safety because that brings us back to cholera and um, eventually I will bring in the COVID-19. Here, we did a study with Orange County Water District in California. We did a study three or four years ago during the height of the drought in California, where because of the lack of water supply, they began to use in this water treatment plant in Orange County, California, which provides Los Angeles with drinking water, wastewater from the sewage plant. The sludge was pumped out to sea and the water was pumped from the sewage plant to the drinking water plant to be processed. Q1 means that that's the water sample coming from the sewage plant after um, it had been crudely filtered. Sodium hypochlorite is added. The water is microfiltered, goes through reverse osmosis. It's UV irradiated. It's eventually chlorinated as well as uh, oxygenated in a variety of other treatments. So by the time it gets to the drinking water fountain in Los Angeles, it is perfectly safe, but we did the analysis to prove that. The gray bubble covers all of these bacteria that are present, including human pathogens, uh, in the input water. By the time it goes through microfiltration and reverse osmosis, the only bacteria, the blue dots on the left, are the typical water bacteria that are present even in the water that we take from a drinking water fountain here in, uh, in, the, in the East Coast or anywhere else. So that means that the filtration treatment processes work well. And similarly for viruses, <clears throat> excuse me, we picked up some adenoviruses and other human viruses 
in the Q1 water, along with pepper mild virus, which would be of consequence only if you were growing peppers, if you were farming. But by the time it's gone through the various treatments, the only viruses are bacteriophages. And these are not pathogenic to humans. So this then demonstrated the treatment process was effective. There was a concern about transmission of antibiotic resistance genes to the naturally occurring water bacteria, but we found that that was not the case, that the only antibiotic resistance was the presence in the naturally occurring aquatic microorganisms that came through in the final treatment. Now let me come to COVID-19. This, of course, is a virus, and I've been discussing a bacterium. This virus is um, nefarious. It affects the lungs. That was how we first understood that it was a disease because of the effect on breathing and, and respiration and the sore throats, the coughing that goes with it. But we have since found that it affects the liver kidneys, the intestines. In fact, for some victims of COVID-19, their only symptom is diarrhea. You know, now, the, we now know that it affects the heart and blood vessels and also the brain. This is because it attaches, since we have learned in this past year of the intensive analysis done by researchers and scientists around the world, that it attaches to the ACE2 receptor site. <clears throat> and it turns out that the ACE2 receptor is present on just about all of the organs of the human body. Hence the attachment and the various symptoms of COVID-19. We very quickly, because we've been doing this DNA analysis, determined that indeed by our technique of next generation sequencing combined with bioinformatics, we can detect the virus in sewage, in stool, and its variants. And so we have been carrying out studies based on this early work by other investigators showing that patients, that is victims of COVID-19, shed the virus in the stool. About half of the patients studied in this particular report showed that significant release of virus in the stool. More to the point, different study looks complicated, but it isn't. Just read from the top down to the bottom. It shows the results for 41 patients. Across horizontally, you can see the results for each patient. The red line means the time period when the throat swab or the nasal swab is positive. The yellow orange line means the time that the stool sample is positive for the virus. And you can see as you look down that the individual patients shed virus in the stool long after, weeks after the throat swab has gone negative. So this means that the sewage or wastewater is a very important measure of the incidence of the virus in the community. Now, I feel very strongly that this technique, which now many cities around the world are using to detect the presence of COVID-19 cases in the community, is an old technique. It goes back 50 years because we first used such a technique to isolate the polio virus to determine its presence in a community some 50 years ago. But I maintain that this is a really important tool that we have neglected. And now that we're beginning to use it for COVID-19, we really need to be continuing to use it as a public health tool to measure the health of the community. So in this case, we've been working with the state of Maryland, studying 50 sites really around the state. <clears throat> These are the sewage treatment plants, as well as the dormitory outlets, sewage outlets, 
nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Here's one example. The blue line is the <clears throat> incidence for um, Frederick, Maryland. You can see that in July, suddenly uptick in the blue line. The blue line represents the N target genes recommended by the Centers for Disease Control. The, uh, the yellowish orange line, we used an, an additional set of genes to confirm that we're picking up the virus. And then we, indeed, we are in the studies that we're doing. And when we saw this uptick, the, within about a week, cases began to increase, the numbers in Frederick, Maryland. So now we're doing not only the incidence of the virus in various counties around the state of Maryland, but we're now launching the detection of the variants as well of the virus. Now, <clears throat> these are the techniques that are very similar to what we've been using for cholera. What we've done is take the model that we developed for the incidence of cholera and using it for COVID-19. We've substituted for COVID-19 instead of salinity, um, we've been substituted humidity and dew point temperature factors are known to be associated with outbreaks of COVID-19. We also continue to use temperature, but we also include population density, cell phone information that can be built into the model, showing tracking of individuals. So on the left, you see our predictive model, the very early one we developed in April, May, of 2020, last year. And you can see the actual cases, April, May, uh, in the United States in um, 2020. We now have perfected the model and we are able to predict the risk. This is a risk map uh, of COVID-19, county by county in the United States. Now I'm going to close by showing you what we should be doing as scientists. I've, I've described for you using satellites, computational modeling, DNA sequencing. Now, this is very good and very helpful for all of us globally, but does it help the individual villagers? Not right away, because they're not going to have access to piped in chlorinated treated water in the near future. But taking the science of having learned that the bacteria are associated with plankton. Plankton are sort of the elephants of the microscopic world. They're 250 micrometers. The bacteria, cholera bacteria are about two micrometers. But the bacteria are attached and associated with plankton. If we can remove the plankton, we should be able to provide safe water. And that's what we did. We developed a technique of using a crude filter, sari cloth, old sari cloth, as you can see, used by women here. The woman doing the filtration is wearing a sari. The old sari cloth is being used as a filter, folded about four to six or eight times, gives a very efficient filter that removes particulate matter and, and copepods and plankton. And so by making sure the women understand that they unfold the sari cloth, rinse it, and then hang it in the sunlight to dry, which disinfects it from the UV of the sunlight, it can be reused as a filter to collect water for their families. And it's not difficult to convince the women who collect the water, the girls and the women, that on the right, you can see clear water, just as clear 
is the water that I'm drinking. And on the left, you can see that the water has turbulence and turbidity showing presence of particulate matter, plankton, and things swimming that the women can easily understand is not good for their children. We were able to reduce cholera 50% in the study funded by NIH in the villages of Bangladesh. And five years after the study had been completed, we went back and found that it was sustainable because not only were the women in the villages continuing to filter, but the control villages where we had not trained or educated how to filter, they had begun to filter as well. So I'd like to acknowledge students, well, colleagues from the International Center for Diarrheal Diseases Research Bangladesh, particularly Dr. Manir Alam, and from Calcutta, India, uh, the study we did on cholera and enteric diseases, Dr. Balakrish Nair and Dr. Ramamurthy, and then from the University of Maryland, the many students and postdocs, current student Kyle Brumfield, and the many other students and postdocs like Daniela Ciaccarelli, uh, Guillaume Constantine Magni, and all the others whom I won't list. Collaborators from other countries, from NASA Ames, um, from ESRI, and uh, from um, uh, within the US other universities. I particularly want to acknowledge Dr. Huck, with whom I have worked for 40 years now. He is, first he was a grad student, now he is a professor himself at the University of Maryland. Dr. Antar Jutla, who is responsible for much, most of the satellite sensing work. He is now a professor of engineering at uh, University of Florida Gainesville. Dr. Hassan, who was a student, is now uh, an adjunct professor and has formed his own company. And then Dr. Sion Young Choi, a wonderful, brilliant scientist responsible for the database and now spends her time with her five-year-old daughter. Um, water is the major challenge of the 21st century, continues to be the challenge. I've written most of this in my book, um, A Lab of One's Own, and I thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have about five questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to ask you uh, from the simplest to maybe more scientific ones too. Uh, the first question is, did cholera ever make it to US? Oh yes, cholera was um, endemic in the United States until about 1920. Uh, we've occasionally continued to have cholera in the Gulf of Mexico, maybe a few cases, one or two a year. One year we had 10 or 12 cases. And this is from individuals going to places where it is known to be contaminated. They're not supposed to collect oysters and crabs, but they do anyway, because the oysters get big and fat uh, in the contaminated areas with all the uh, sewage coming in and they get sick. Um, so uh, it's controlled in the US by safe drinking water being piped in as it is in Europe and, um, and Japan and, and um, Singapore. Thank you. So you talked about the water filtration and uh, also detecting the virus uh, via studying the stools. Um, do you think that we need to be drinking uh, bottled water, filtered water? Uh, would COVID virus find its way in the sewage come back to filter water that we drink? Well, actually, uh, the answer is no. I think it's perfectly safe to uh, drink uh, tap water, and that's what I'm drinking right now, uh, mainly because as I showed you, the treatment process removes the viruses. What we're left with are just bacteriophages. And so I think um, we've been able to demonstrate by the elegant sequencing, next generation sequencing coupled with bioinformatics, the safety of the water that uh, is being distributed throughout the country. So let me ask a more scientific one. Any thoughts on natural or engineered bacteriophage 
to regulate the bad microbes in the environment? Um, I don't know about the environment, uh, uh, but I know that there's been some lovely work done showing that you can treat with bacteriophages. Uh, it was proposed actually in 1915 by Twatch and Durrell, uh, two French scientists, that the viruses would, would kill the bacteria. But the uh, problem is that they do mutate rapidly. However, in cases of multiple resistant bacterial infections, it has been shown that you can treat with a bacteriophage targeted directly to that bacterium in the patient. And you can then uh, use the bacterial viruses as a treatment. Um, it still hasn't been perfected, but in serious cases, it can be used. By the way, to the previous question, I should say that I want to leave the question open because if you are taking water from, um, from not from the centrally treated system, but from a well or from um, the direct environment, the person-to-person -person trans the uh, transmission from co uh, contaminated water still might hold. Okay. Is there any relationship between uh, eutrophic dead zones influencing cholera dynamics? Good question. The answer I would predict is no, uh, is an inverse relationship because it turns out that um, this uh, inverse relationship with uh, um, sewage, uh, the bacteria really prefer to be in an aerated um, uh, zone <clears throat> for, for more rapid growth and, and uh, productivity. Thank you. Do you have any recommendation for how universities can safely reopen while COVID-19 is present in the community? Would testing on campus wastewater play a useful role? Yes, it does. Um, we are doing studies with some colleges and universities where we actually test from individual dormitories. And we've been able to show that when we pick up in a single dormitory, you can quickly go in, test, and then isolate those who are uh, test positive. And instead of having to close down the whole campus and um, you know, shut down the operations, uh, you can really um, isolate very quickly uh, the units that are contributing uh, to the, could, could be contributing to a more extensive infection. I would also say that um, um, it's important. We, I, I do think we're going to be having to maintain masking, distancing, hand washing, and sensible um, techniques for reducing the potential for infection well into the end of this year, if not a bit longer. And we may end up continuing, particularly since we've noted that there's been almost no influenza this year because of so many of us properly masking and hopefully all of us would properly mask and hence not transmission by the micro droplet technique or, or method. And so I think that we'll find as the Japanese have done for years, when someone has an infection, they'll wear a mask uh, in public. So I think we may see the end of handshaking, <laughs> the beginning of masking. Right. So, um, Maybe this is a more of a reference uh, question. Uh, what is the model that you use to predict COVID-19 cases? Uh, this is a, um, a distributed model, a mathematical model um, that you'll have to get the details from Dr. Jutla at the University of Florida. We've been working together. Um, I, of course, published the 20 years ago, the first um, um, use of satellite sensing um, and that was very crude. It was simply taking, uh, working with the NASA scientists and taking the um, satellite sensed uh, temperature, sea surface height, chlorophyll, 
and uh, throwing in salinity and a few other factors. And now this particular model that we use for COVID-19 is highly sophisticated uh, using dew point uh, temperatures and uh, uh, humidity values and um, integrating uh, movement measured by cell phone and using other more sophisticated satellite sensing for movement of populations to build the risk uh, prediction that we provide. So would the sea level rise make our water safety more challenging moving forward? If so, how can we use technology to prevent it? Uh, it will make it more challenging. Um, we're, we're now 7 billion in a very short time, relatively speaking, geologically time speaking. And we're uh, slated to go to 10 billion, though I must say that mother nature tends to intervene and this pandemic is probably one example, unfortunately, of it. Uh, with more than a million dead globally. Um, I, I think with the sea level rise, um, we will find that, um, first of all, we will have areas like Miami, Florida, permanently flooded in 20, 30 years. Uh, right now, uh, I understand those who live in Miami at very high tides, at least once a month, uh, they're walking around uh, downtown slushing in water. So that's going to get more um, frequent and more intense. Um, I think there are techniques of desalination and recycling. And I do think that we waste enormous, um, not only opportunities, but enormous wealth by not recycling sewage and sewage water. I think we've got the methods for that now, and we could be turning our sewage treatment plants into energy generation plants, because right now we just burn off the methane that's produced, which is crazy. That methane could be piped uh, and we can light and heat Cities like Washington, D.C., there's plenty of hot air there. We could, if we could trap the hot air, that would even be a greater source of energy. Sorry, that couldn't resist the joke. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I hear you. <laughs> so last two questions. Um, uh, it looks like we are taking bigger precautions for COVID than cholera. Is it more dangerous, the COVID, compared to cholera? Oh, COVID's more dangerous. Um, it's highly transmissible. Uh, cholera is really, uh, it's, it, it, um, you have to ingest um, poorly cooked or uncooked fish or shellfish and drink water uh, that's contaminated. Whereas with COVID, um, I think we're going to find, in fact, we're doing some work on this right now, that uh, it's transmitted long distances, not just six feet or 12 feet or 20 feet. And it's the micro droplets uh, that can be carried long distances. And it turns out, at least from the preliminary data, it doesn't take very many viruses to initiate an infection. So it's highly transmissible. And with the variants becoming even more transmissible and with the symptomatology, because of the fact that all of these cells, the, the receptor sites, the ACE2 receptors, are so widely distributed in the body um, we're finding that, um, I was just reading a very tragic story in the Washington Post this morning over my coffee um, of um, a, um, a victim of COVID-19, a 30-year-old, otherwise very healthy athletic woman who is now suffering the um, post-COVID-19 um, um, syndrome, which is two years later and um, debilitating. So um, it, it's, um, it's by far much worse because cholera is easily controlled, easily, uh, by safe water. Um, and um, we, don't, we don't get vaccinated for it. Uh, we, we take it for granted. Whereas in countries like uh, Bangladesh and parts of India, parts of Latin America, and other countries of Asia, where they don't have access to safe water, uh, cholera is a, is a pandemic. So the last question is, uh, what does your model say when I can go back to campus and start 
start taking selfies with students and uh, hang out socially? Well, I got my second COVID vaccine shot on Friday. And then you have to wait two to four weeks uh, before you consider yourself immune. But I shall continue to mask and um, um, glove and, and um, protect myself and my, my colleagues and my friends and neighbors. But I'll feel less endangered, less risk prone after I get my second vaccine shot and after the uh, three, two or three weeks or, or a month after that second shot when the immune uh, system has kicked in to high gear. Um, so I think once we have got, just as Dr. Fauci, I guess we're calling him Guru Fauci now. Uh, he's the man who tells us the truth. Um, I think um, he is suggesting that we might be um, back to, to, not back to normal, but in the new normal within about a year. When, when 60 to, well, when 70% of the population has either been vaccinated or <laughs> has been exposed <laughs> and recovered. Well, on that positive note, we are really, really thrilled that you took the time to talk to all our students and our faculty and also other people from the CSUs that I see have logged in to listen to you. It's such a privilege and honor for having you come and talk to us. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate. And also, uh, sorry that uh, we couldn't have you here and have dinner with our family. And I hope we can do that sometime soon since you're taking the vaccine and we are going to be taking soon. So look forward to seeing you here in person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much too. I, I've been most grateful to have the opportunity to, to speak with you and to meet you virtually, but I'm going to take that rain check on the visit. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you all for joining those that are in the audience. Uh, we really appreciate you participating in this. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Kawa. It was nice to virtually meet you and not just be another name on an email. Uh, and and Thank big you. thanks. <laughs> Thanks to Vicky as well for uh, helping to make sure we kept the trains on time. Did I you will, notice my tie? <laughs> I will, Roberto. Yes. <laughs> Did you notice the tie that is? Um, oh, like, it's one of the yeah diatoms. <laughs> Diatom tie, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Cheerio. Anyway. Bye, bye bye. Thank you. Oh well. Bye bye. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Sastri. Well, that was great. I think uh, it went well. At the peak, I saw about 60, at least 